Welcome back to Paranormal Roundtable. I'm your host, Josh Turner, and with me is my uh, guest and, of course, my co-host, Martin Nunley. And we got a lot to talk about, so let's jump right back into it and let's uh, let's continue. Thank you. I spent, you know, a uh, little over three weeks in Equatorial Africa back in 2013. And uh, we went in through... We went in through Rwanda and into Uganda and then um, went from Uganda up to the extreme northwestern corner of Uganda where South Sudan, uh, the Congo, and Uganda all comes together. And then we went from there up into the south part of the Darfur area of South Sudan. Sudan and you know we were the only white people there for miles and miles and miles you know um, we were quite a curiosity but I had the opportunity to talk to, to some of the locals there about that and about Bigfoot now they to the to the to the locals the um, I can't pronounce it the Mumbamba or whatever it is. You know, Makili Mumbembe. Yeah, that th- there is no question about it. It's there. I mean, it's it's there. They um, they respect its ter- its territory. They don't go messing with it. They 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 leave it alone. <laughs> but but it's there. Uh, as far as the locals are concerned. They also talk about, they know about Bigfoot. And they know about something that's, that's you know, a lot bigger and taller and that even the gorillas won't mess with. Um, but they, uh, I didn't, like I said, I found no evidence of one. I've never found anybody that said they'd seen one, but I heard stories about them over there um just the same as i heard stories about them down in central america and and such but i never found any any hard evidence but to the to the locals you know it's it's there it they're there just as sure as as uh the, as, as rabbits and squirrels and rats and <laughs> mice are there so they're I'm surprised that they haven't found something, something that could account for the stories of the, of the, the dinosaur down there. In fact, I talked to a guy that I worked with there. He was one of the guys on the construction crew of, we were building a a chapel down there. And he was talking about that. That's not the only thing that's in there, that there's something that runs around in there. That's, that's, it's not a velociraptor, but it's not a T-Rex. It's something in between, but not, it, it's more, it's not half the size of the two. It's, it's like maybe double the size of a velociraptor that runs around down in there. Um, that was a new one on me. <laughs> Don't tell them what's all down there. Don't tell them what's in those jungles down there. You're right. You're right. There is no telling. It just astounds me how, where we were, <laughs> there was only one road, if you could call it. There was a there was a cleared area through the through the countryside that you could sometimes drive a, a wheeled vehicle on. That's about all you can say about it. But you know it, it uh, but it was the only road, and everything. If you want to venture off the road, you're afoot. And they literally would drive through the bush. You know they they would have. Uh, most of the vehicles down there are like are Toyotas and diesel powered Toyota four wheel drive trucks are like forerunners. And, uh, you know, they, they drive for miles and miles out through the bush, but then they get to a point they can't even do that. It's, uh, unless you've been over there, you really can't understand how remote and undeveloped it still is. 
and how large and vast the the countries are there because Africa yeah. is a humongous. It's a, it's a continent. A lot of people are so are so naive. They they act like. I mean, I'm sure a lot of them know that it's technically a continent, but people talk about Africa like it's just one big yeah. country, and it's not. It's a, it's a continent. I, I was astounded how long it took us to fly the short route north south over the Sahara Desert. I was utterly astounded how many hours it took us to fly over, you know, in a jetliner, in a KLM jetliner. <laughs> you know, like you said, it's it's way larger than people. And I was astounded how long it took us to fly over Lake Victoria. I mean, we took off, and I thought we'd just we'd, we'd take off out of out of Rwanda, and and you know, fifteen minutes later, be landing in Entebbe, Uganda. No, heck, no. You know, it, it was 45 minutes an hour flying 450, 500 miles an hour, something like that, <laughs> to get across that thing. So you so you guys flew from R- Rwanda into Uganda? Yes. Uh-huh. And then we flew in a, then we flew in a little single engine plane from, uh, from, uh, we, when we got in a, we went by van from Entebbe up to, um, Kampala, which is the capital of of um, uh, Uganda, and then we flew. We got in a in a little missionary air service uh, single engine airplane, and we flew from there up to a little town. And like I said, it's right up in the extreme northwestern corner of Uganda, right next to the Congo and and South Sudan, and refueled and. Um, and then we took off and we flew from there up to right outside a place called Moundry West in the state of West Equatoria, South Sudan. And we landed on a dirt strip out in the middle of nowhere um, where we took off from a dirt, dirt strip <laughs> and, uh, when we left uh, Kampala. And you you were in you were in you were in South Sudan, like in, in were you in the west or yep. the east of of Sudan? We were in a little. Uh, let me. This is this is the country of South Sudan, and it, and we were in the state of West Equatoria. We we crossed the equator twice, uh, get, get, getting there, um, and it was during the rainy season, but. Um, uh, we we stayed in a in a little village called Lui, L U I, and it was a it was only like I think twenty eight miles from Mundry, and um, but it you know it was an hour's drive because of the condition of the road, the only road through the area, um, and they had just repaired the road before we got there. They said before you can. You know, losing an armored vehicle out there—you <laughs> lose a tank out in some of the holes in that road. Uh, but anyway, I got to know him well enough that I talked to him about you know cryptids and things like that, and and uh, you know I was surprised to to hear some of the same stuff from those guys over there in Africa that I you know that I would hear here. So. What did they say about like, I mean, like as far as like different, because I know you had a lot of different tribal, like they're a loose confederation of tribes basically that came together right. to form a country. Um, but, but like a lot of the population of South Sudan is, is I believe they're like under 25 or something like that. Um, yeah. The, because the, the, there, there was the, one guy everybody was, was killed because of the wars. Exactly. The, 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 the murder and the, the genocide was unbelievable that the Islamic that the uh, Muslims inflicted upon the Christian tribes as well as the other tribes who were animists, you know, who, you know, worshiped other things, but, um, you know, that were not Christian. It was unbelievable. The genocide that was, that was wreaked on those tribes for generations. And, um, it, it, the stories that we heard and even people that we saw that had survived it, you know, they'd come into a village and they would, uh, they would, all of the young girls and the, and the young boys, you know, below a certain age, 
they'd just take them and you know they'd steal them and sell them into slavery or or stuff like that. And then the the adults and the 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 old the the most of the teenage boys they'd walk them down to the riverbank, line them up, and they'd either chop their heads off with machetes or just shoot them in the back and kick them off in the river. And um, there was a there was a young man there in the village there in, in Louis where we were that had survived. Uh, you know, they attempted to behead him and uh, they cut through most of the muscles and tendons and everything. So he, he walked around with his, his head flopped over to one side, you know, because everything was was severed. Somehow he somehow he they, they they did that and then they kicked him into the river and he you know he held his breath long enough that that um they had moved on down the line and and he was able to you know act like he floated up and catch a breath and and he managed to get out before the crocodiles got him but it's you know people hear about stuff like this and they think oh you know that's but to be there and see it and see the results of it and, and talk to the people who survived this was just unbelievable. Yeah. Because, I mean, a lot of people blame, like, the, the Europeans for that because the Congo was the Belgian, uh, you know, but but honestly, it was the Ottomans. I mean, and actually, I think it was Ottoman, it was Egypt. Yeah. Uh, it was Egypt under the Ottoman Empire. And I don't know who the leader right. was, but I know he was something, some kind of, you know, something Pasha or something. And he was the one that actually um he instituted he he created institutional slavery there in those right. those sub-Saharan countries that were right below North Africa. And the reason we're talking about this folks right. is because it gives you some idea of of how these people had to survive. They've gone so far into the bush and had to be so right. they're so remote and they're there for a reason because if they pop their heads out they would have been taken down. I mean, because the the northern uh, in Sudan, the, the the Islamic population was was clearly committing genocide, and it had been institutionalized by Ottoman Egypt. And a lot of people say, "Oh, well, it's the Europeans, the, the colonialists, whatever." And I'm not a fan of the British Empire. I can I'll be the first to tell you I can't stand Britain, but. Um, they did do a lot to try to suppress the slave trade, uh, there. And, and I think it was like in the 18th century, they began to try to fight against it. But when the Ottomans took it over, it was pretty much a done deal. And I had a friend the other day that actually argued with me that, the, that, that they don't, that they don't have, they don't believe in slavery. And I'm like, dude, the slave trade was fueled. I mean, the Ottomans themselves, like it was a huge mm -hmm. slave trade. I mean, it, it was, it, it wasn't Islamic country. And it's still you know? wide open. They were while we were there, we met. Uh, there were people that there were mercenaries and soldiers and stuff in the area, and and we were. I was actually asked two different times if I'd heard anything about the Lord's army. Well, there's this guy, and that's not the Lord like Christ the Lord. That's a guy named Lord. That he he is a a Muslim, and he is a he. He hides out in the jungles right across the border in in the Congo, and uh, and he makes raids across the border into South Sudan, and like I said, he and he steals all these kids, you know, and and, and sells them into slavery, kids and, and women. And um, yeah, it's very common, and, and it still goes on all over yeah. Africa. Um, right. And so there, you know, but there, but there were UN troops that were looking for him. And we had some Belgian uh, mercenaries that that oh, yeah. came in there. All over the place. I didn't see. I didn't see how they got there. I was told that they flew in in a helicopter. Now I don't. I didn't see this for myself. Didn't hear it or anything. But I was asked by a Belgian mercenary if I had seen or heard anything about the Lord's Army or where they might be, and I had not heard a word, so I couldn't help him. And uh, and I actually I asked some of the the locals there and they hadn't heard anything either but i think he was he was operating more to the west of us and luckily you didn't run into any of the nigerian fulani because they are all over the place in africa every country you go to south africa west africa i didn't go to the east but i can tell you you'll run into them everywhere <clears throat> they are 
like all over the place. I mean, it's yeah. it's and they and you know, there's Boko Haram, there's all these different groups and you know, and they are are sponsored, you know, by other terrorist organizations that basically and they their job is to exterminate uh Christians and pagans and what they consider to be pagan is anyone who's not a Christian, Muslim or, or Jewish. But they right. will exterminate them and they will unless right. and they'll even exterminate other Muslims who don't believe the way they do because there's like Sunni and Shiite and then it just it gets really right. convoluted. But you know, going down that's a whole different rabbit hole. But if anybody ever wants to talk about it off air or whatever, I know a whole lot about that stuff. Um, but but these people they're they're way up in the middle of nowhere, and so you you actually talk to these people, these tribes people about the uh, about these different creatures. You ask them about Bigfoot or like how did you go right. about doing that? How did yep. that? Well, I I uh, I had my phone with me, so I was able to show them some pictures and everything. And when I showed them pictures, oh yeah, <laughs> they knew about them, and you know they then they you know would I'd show them and they'd be you know talking amongst themselves and everything and i um you know and i did a did a call one time and scared the crap out of them oh yeah it was it, I, I only did it one time because i mean it absolutely terrified them and uh so uh i i only did that one time <laughs> but uh I found out that, that, you know, you don't joke around. <laughs> around. I, I mean, I wasn't doing it as a joke at all. I was doing it to tell them what it sounded like. But I was also, you know, late, a couple of times we'd be joking around about some things. And, you know, you could accidentally do things that did scare them to death. And, um, but, um, you know, they're, uh, they, uh, They didn't. <laughs> I I certainly wasn't going to do any more calls after that one I did. And uh, but you know it's funny. I mean, they're used to the weird sounds of the of the jungle and everything. And I used to. Uh, I mean, we used to lay in the bed and listen to the in the early early morning. You know, right around daylight or just before, listen to all the weird birds and things that would start singing. And so when 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 you. You you didn't see anything or have any encounters or anything like that over there in Africa, right? No. Okay, so when you not. so let's move back to when you came back when you came back to the states. Well, we came back, and uh, I mean it was just no big deal. But but I have a I spent time uh, down in Central America in um, uh, El Salvador, some in a little bit. Well, we passed through Eastern. Uh, Costa Rica, and I spent time along the uh, along the south border of Guatemala. Uh, we supposedly were in there spying on what the Soviets had going in Guatemala, but it turned out all we were doing was helping the DEA spy on the cartel in Guatemala. And so, you know, I spent time with some of the natives there. I mean, some of the local folks there did find out that Along the Mid-Continental Ridge, there are still cannibals, and there are still Carib Indians down there. We had two people disappear out of the compound that we were at there in in north uh, in uh, northern El Salvador. One guy disappeared without a trace. He was a, a Corps of Engineers guy operating a bulldozer. The other guy was a platoon leader that thought he was like a Rambo. He was sort of a Rambo type, and and a uh, you know, ultra gung ho and wouldn't didn't want to stick with his group and he was out freewheeling about thirty yards out to the side of his group when they were on patrol and he disappeared. We found uh of course everybody we had to unask the camp and everybody had to go looking for him and uh we ended up finding his left leg speared to a tree. And about two hundred yards from that we found his intestines. That's all we ever found to him. What year was this? This would have been in 1989. Okay, still the still the 30 year civil war was going on at that time. Correct. Yeah. We, yeah. It didn't end until it, the mid 90s, you know, and there was a lot of correct. talk of black ops and operations taking place, mercenaries going down. They're speaking of Belgian mercenaries, 
Um, so, so yeah, what, what, and you, so you were near the El Salvadorian border. Yes, we were in El Salvador and we were, we were operating, operating out of a sort of thrown together FOB that was, um, in Northwestern El Salvador, just South of the Guatemalan border. We could see that you could hike, you could walk from where we were to the border of, um, of El Salvador and Guatemala. And we worked up and we worked along the border of the northern borders of El Salvador, Honduras, and Belize. So, did, did you have any encounters with like um, cryptids? I mean, like what we would call humanoids, or what? What did you have down no, there? No, none whatsoever. I asked Clyde and I, uh, a buddy of mine that was there, and he was a, a researcher also. We researched quite a bit on military bases in the U.S. Um, he, uh, and he spoke the language very fluently and we, we talked a lot with the locals and we got a lot of stories, uh, heard tons of stories of the white lady, which is a ghostly figure, a ghost or something that's, in fact, it's, and that's real common. You hear about that all in the culture down there. Um, and it's, it's, it's like a ghost or something or a spirit lady. And it's, and they, they, they fear it just like the natives fear you, the skinwalkers and stuff here. And, um, uh, you know, and, and the shapeshifters and things here heard a lot of that heard stories about, um, Oh, I cannot remember what they called them. But there are there were Bigfoot stories down there. We never found I mean we were in, out in the in the boonies in the jungle a lot. Never saw any track, never saw anything that I thought was even remotely uh, you know Bigfoot sign. We never saw any cryptid, any paranormal stuff at all. Saw a lot of unfortunately, you know, doped up kids that had been given guns and told to go out and kill anybody that doesn't look like them. But I never saw anything that, that I thought was anything paranormal or Bigfoot related down there. And they, did you talk to any of the locals about the stories that they have? Yes, we, we very specifically did. Yes. Like I said, we heard lots and lots of stories about the, the this white lady that's, uh, that it's considered a bad omen and this one thing. Hey, I'll tell you one thing we did here. We did hear, we heard chupacabra stories and believe it or not, we heard pterodactyl stories. Uh huh. Yeah. The, the, in, in Guatemala in particular, they call this creature the corta cabeza. It's a head. They call it the head chopper. Yes, mm -hmm. that is, that is correct. And there is one that is supposedly big enough that it can swoop down and grab a person and haul them off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And I'll tell you something else, too. Uh, there in 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 uh, Belize and part of Honduras and stuff around some of these ruined sites and stuff, you talk about, you know, there's there'll be tourists and people and you go in there the day in the it starts getting dark. Nobody stays around there. They get the heck. They get the heck out of there. <laughs> I mean, nobody stays around those those sites after dark. And in fact, in fact, they leave well before dark. Uh, we were we were cutting through part of southeastern Costa Rica. Going heading into into uh, Nicaragua, and we're going along. We were going through an abandoned banana plantation, and I was concentrating on staying away from the banana front, front fronds hanging down and stuff because of the all the stuff they told us about the um, little green vine snakes that that hang around the the fronds of bananas out there. Uh, catching the, the birds and the bugs and the mice and stuff that come up there to Some eat nasty them. Nasty spiders that hang out in those things too. 
Yeah. Oh yeah. God. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're really bad. Yeah. I mean, really, really bad. You got to be yeah. careful. Just plucking yeah. one. But uh, so when you when you were down there and you had you you interacted with with the locals and they told you stories about these uh, creatures or whatever and did well, anybody well, have what any? I was, well, what I was going, what I was getting to about the banana plant banana banana plantation we're walking along and um uh, it's getting late in the evening and we were you know we were getting to the point we were looking for a place to bivouac overnight and we walked up on this freaking colonial looking house out in the middle of nowhere that that and it reminded me <laughs> of uh you know, when I was up there, in, in, when I was telling you about when I was up there in the Bennington Triangle several years later, what is now called the Bennington Triangle, came up on those couple of houses that were just abandoned with all the stuff in them. That's what this, and I, it made me think up there in in uh, Vermont, or, or was that New Hampshire? I think it's in New Hampshire. I can't remember. But anyway, made me think about down in in uh, Costa Rica, we walked up out in 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 the late afternoon, we walked up on this old house, and it apparently is where the whoever used to run that banana plantation lived. Because it was it was a big two story house, and uh, still had furniture and everything in it. Well, we stopped, and a couple of guys went in there and cleared the house. And somebody says, "Well, we're going. We can, I'll stay here over the night." And three or four of the guys that were veterans down there had spent time. No, absolutely not. We're getting, we're getting the heck away from this place. In no way are we going to stay around this old house. <laughs> so, we got out of there, and I tried to find out. Well, why would we not stay in that old house? I didn't want to because it was creepy as all get out. My my skin was crawling. My hair was standing up when I when I saw the thing. It, it sort of reminded me of the old of the old John Wayne movie, uh, the Green Beret. When they're going out through the jungles there in Vietnam, and they come up on this house out there that was like an officer's club or something in the middle of nowhere, and uh, it sort of reminded me of that. Just in the middle of nowhere, here's a, a nice two-story house. <laughs> of course, it had been sitting there abandoned for well, in the jungle, it's hard to tell, but probably four or five years or so. And you didn't run into like a Sonic or a Walmart because they're like everywhere in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> No, no matter where you go, you can be in the middle did, of nowhere, we, and there's like a there's like a Sonic or a Walmart. Yeah. You're like those two are just. Hey, we did find a few Dollar General stores. <laughs> no, I don't doubt that either. They're <laughs> everywhere too. So, <laughs> we, so let me ask you a question. Uh, changing direction yeah. here. When 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 you 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 were talking earlier about Bigfoot and the etherealness of it. Yeah. Tell us about your experiences yeah. with the shofar horn. That's one of the things that me and you had okay. talked about before. Yeah. Well, tell you what. You know, I, it it took Mark Maycheck and I years to go to go through this scripture and stuff like that and figure out what the heck they were talking about. Some of these scriptures that they that the voice of God could you know could call the Nephilim, you know, bring in the Nephilim and the angels and stuff. It took us years to, to of going through all these old texts and things and talking to biblical scholars and you know and Greek scholars and and I ended up talking to a Jewish mystic up in upstate New York and to find out about the shofar, specifically what this thing was. And I found out there's three kinds of shofars. And you and you had to use this this one specific kind. And once I got my hands on one, it took me over a year, probably more like two years, to learn how to blow the thing in the correct manner. I mean, it's easy to blow one and make a sound. It sounds like a bullhorn, but it's exceedingly difficult to blow it in the manner that, that to do it, to actually call up the boogers. When I finally learned how to do it, the first time when I finally got where I could do the right notes on it, I said, I've got to go to some place that I know is a pretty sure fire, pretty sure fire place that I've had extremely good results in the past. 
And this is when I was living in right outside the little town of Kirksville, Missouri, in northern Missouri, about 35 miles south of the Iowa state line. That's where I lived up in. I lived up there from 2002 to uh, to um, uh, 2020, uh, 2020. So I w- there was a place up in Iowa that I knew was a sure bet. So I had uh, there were some guys that I was uh, researching with up there, and um, called them up, and I said, well, most of these guys lived in Iowa. And I said, hey, y'all want to go with me and I'm going to try out this shofar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) They all for it. So off we go. And we go up to to a place that's uh, not too far from the Mississippi River. That's, you know, in in the, uh, I guess you'd call it East Central Iowa. And... It's a place that that the boogers have been pretty uh, vocal, pretty responsive in the past. First time I ever went up there, I was by myself, and they ran me out of there. So, uh, so I went up. So uh, up, off we go. Now, anybody's researched very much, and, and you, there's an area that you, you know that there's a group of boogers that live in or big foot that live in an area. Know that that they have a home territory and you can't find them in the same place every time. You can't go to the same place and and do your calling or whatever and expect them to show up every time. You know, they might be 10 miles away. They might be two miles away, two or three miles away. So we go to the first place and I'm having a hard time hitting the notes. I finally managed to squawk out one and Nothing happened. I wasn't really sure if I did it right. We go down to the next place, and I was really hoping that we could get it at the first place because it's a lot less scary there. They've got a lot more. There's open, a lot more open space there between the woods and, and where I was calling from. So I had sort of a buffer zone. The other place is down on a gravel road that follows a creek down at bottom in a creek bottom. Pretty tight. I got down there and I started trying to blow it, blow it, and I spent 20 minutes doing it wrong. No response whatsoever. And we were just about to give up. And I said, Well, I'm going to try it one more time. Put a bunch of chapstick on my lips. I cut loose and I was able to hit one correct note for about four seconds and my god it was like you threw a switch the woods erupted around us we got screams from three different directions and loud screams and I waited just a little bit and I cut loose again and I was able to hit that same note for about four seconds and they were zeroed in on us and we could hear them coming from three different directions hard and fast and and bellering their heads off about every five to ten seconds now the crazy thing was we started hearing between us and the boogers that were coming from the southwest we started hearing a bunch of coyotes start carrying on the coyotes ran out in the road and came towards us with their tails tucked between their legs, looking back over their shoulders in that direction. They came up to where they got close enough that they could easily see it. I mean, they came up within like 25, 30 yards of us and were whining and carrying on and hanging around out in the road. They were actually coming to us for protection. and. These boogers came in hard, loud, and fast. I mean, tearing through the woods. They came in until they could see us and stopped and shut up. And the coyotes 
are out there. Actually, some of them are actually laying down in the road. But it, we realized we had three different groups because these three groups stayed together and did not even pay attention to the other ones. You know, I've, I have heard, I have, uh, I've heard different groups of boogers fight. I've heard, you know, I've heard tremendous fights between them before. They totally ignored the other ones. And they, they just stayed out there about 35, 40 yards out into the woods. And, um, it's like they were waiting, waiting on me to do something or tell them something or something. I don't know. That's that's the, the weird part about it is, so we did this, that was the first time. We stayed there about 30, 45 minutes, and they started sort of just wandering away, wandering away. And once they left, the coyotes got up and went back in the woods. <laughs> And um, so we went to a place where um, there was a researcher by the name of Kelly Mattingly, who was an excellent female researcher that researched with us for years. And um, she was from Texas. She uh, she died of cancer, but she had a friend that was from southeastern Iowa. So, and she had described to me year, you know, decades before this. Uh, you know, where she was from and, and what it looked like. And I was able to figure out exactly where this was. And it was right on the, right on the Mississippi river. And, um, so we went, went to that place and, um, we got there and, and I had been there about, oh, 15 years before. And it was still just like the, 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 this lady, this Kelly's friend had described it. So we, when we got to it that night, you know, with the shofar, it had been developed. There were, um, there were a bunch of, you know, fancy river, you know, waterfront houses there. And they had a big gate across the place and a guard shack and everything. And, um, uh, so we couldn't go in there, but there was a public boat ramp on the road that led into the south end of this place, north end of the place, excuse me. On the way in, we saw quite a bit of booger sign. Sound a lot, a lot of you know, twisted and broken limbs and such. Uh, we actually came back there later, you know, sometime later in the in the daylight, and took you know, took pictures of a bunch of the stuff we found. But anyway, we found this boat ramp, and it was the parking lot of the boat ramp was tied up against the Mississippi levee. The levee right there is about 12, 14 feet high. And we were on the river side of the levee. So I thought, and there were some islands out in the river right there. And she had described those islands, you know, that, that when she was a girl, they used to go out there and, and, you know, go fishing around them and stuff and how the boogers would yell and scream at them and throw stuff at them and stuff off those islands. So you could see those islands from that boat ramp. So I said, well, this is a great place because, you know, with the levee behind me and everything and the open boat ramp in front of me in the parking area, it's like being an amphitheater. So I uh, I blew the shofar and had two different groups of, of boogers respond out on the islands. And the adult members, several of the adult members from each one of them actually waded out in the water from the islands until they were... Uh, to them, probably almost chest deep in the water. And um, the scary part was we're standing there backed up against this um, this levee, and one of the guys punched me in the side with his elbow, and I looked over at him, and he did his thumb pointing up and behind us, turned around, and there was a, there was a damn big... Looked like an alpha male booger standing up on the levee, looking down at us. How, how tall was it? That dude was probably, I'm guessing that fucker was nine to ten feet tall. His toes were seven feet from our heads. <laughs> you saw about a brown summit. He, he stood up there and never mounted. He didn't growl. He didn't do anything. He just stood there looking at us. 
know whether to wind my rear end or scratch my watch. And we sat there and looked at each other for a minute or two, and we slowly backed away from the levee towards the boat ramp. And he just stood there and looked at us and for a while, and then he turned around and walked off. But now, when he, this time, when he walked away, we clearly heard the footfalls. And he walked probably about 30, 40 feet back into the whatever the brush or whatever was on the other side of that levee and stopped. So we, could, we clearly heard the footfalls, and all of a sudden, they just stopped. And we heard him shuffling his feet around a little bit. But he was still there. But now, I've used the shofar in Oklahoma, in um, Texas, Tennessee, Kentucky, Missouri, Alabama, Iowa. Where else? Uh, what part of Texas? East Texas. Yeah, the thicket. Well, well, actually, north, northeast, north. Oh, Louisiana. Uh, Louisiana, nor- Northeast Texas, actually, um, uh, actually is the crow flies not too far from Jefferson. And I've had these same types of results that if I can hit the correct note, there, there's two notes that you try to hit, that, that only two notes work and they're extremely difficult to do. If you can hit one of those two notes or both of them, any of them that are within earshot of you will come in as hard and fast as they can. And they come, I mean, so far, they come and they get they get close enough that they can lay eyeballs on you and they just stop. And they hang out for a while. And it's like they're expecting something. But I don't know what what to do. So I've quit using it because... I figure if I keep this crap up, I'm doing something that I don't know what the effect is. And I'm afraid that I'm going to do something that I'm going to get the wrong bunch of boogers. And they're going to come in and snatch my head off, you know. So so we we don't do the shofar. I have one, one other research buddy that's got a shofar, and we just don't do it anymore. And uh, because we don't know what we're doing. All we know is that it, it works just like the scripture said. And that's another reason we think that there is some kind of connection with Bigfoot and the Nephilim. Because the scriptures clearly say that the Nephilim have to respond, are compelled to respond to the voice of God. And when we researched that, the voice of God was a shofar in a very specific kind of shofar. We thought the voice of God was actually God's voice. No, the voice of God is an object. So, and Mark and I have got, hell, all total. Well, Barton, you've probably heard Mark talk about it. Hell, we've probably first, Mark Mark was the one that that discovered all this. Do what? Right. He's, what, what we've been messing with is what, 10 years? (laughs) I mean, that that Mark's been digging into this. Mark and I have been digging into this into this for 15. Over, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I've been, I've been blowing the show far for for five or six, you know, four or five or six, four or five years, and it was, and we had ten years invested in it before that. So this was hard, right. very hard won knowledge. You know, it took a, it took a heck of a lot of research to to, to figure all this out, and right. so I, that's why I'm convinced. Because they do respond the way they do to a shofar, to the correct shofar with the correct two notes, that there is some connection with the Nephilim. I don't know what. Right, so there's another strike against the relic hominid theory. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Correct. So, so you and Mark have been down in the LBL several times, right, Tim? Oh Lord, yeah, many times. First time so, I was in LBL with Mark was in. Well, we've uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know where you're leading, Barton. <laughs> uh, 
We had a deal that every one of us there experienced it. Anybody that's seen the movie uh, The Matrix, when they were in a house somewhere and they were going along and all of a sudden they, uh, it's like the reality around them shifted a little bit and then popped back the way it should have been. And and that's when, uh, oh, what's his name? Not Neo, but the, the guy that was sort of the, the leader. He realized that that was the uh, machines or the robots or whatever, resetting the program or doing something, that they were breaking into the program that they'd been discovered. We had an incident right. like that. We had an incident like that happen to us there in LBL. Every single one of us experienced it and noticed it. And we were, and nobody, none of us were, had the guts to talk about it until it really affected Mark. And he it strongly affected Mark. And he goes and gets in the truck, and I could tell something was wrong, and all of us were sort of disconcerted. So I go to Mark, and I, 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 are you okay? No. <laughs> and so we get to talking, and he told me exactly what he saw, and I'm like, holy crap, you know. And... <laughs> Another one of the researchers was there within earshot and heard Mark say that, and he was standing there, and I noticed he was unusually quiet and still. And we were looking in different directions. But we all experienced this little time shift or something. I don't know what you'd call it. But there were there were about eight of us there, and we all experienced it. You said you you blew the horn in Oklahoma too. Oh yeah, uh -huh. where, where where about was that? Was that near Brown Springs or? Uh, oh uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because I would figure that area hey, right there is hey, a hotbed I, along around Texoma too. And we, uh, um, we had believe it or not zero results. Now every when the times I've blown it. I don't get results everywhere because the boogers are not within earshot. Now, one of some of the most fantastic results that I had with it was in an area of Oklahoma, central Oklahoma. And I was with members of the Kiowa Nation on tribal land, and they knew the countryside like the back of their hands. And we brought boogers in from over two miles away from two directions. Actually, they came from three directions, but the one, the third direction, they didn't have, they only came from about a half a mile away. But we had, we had boogers come from over two miles away and from two directions. But the same thing happened. They came in till they could see us and then they just stopped and stood there. And they totally ignored the other groups. That This is, Every single time that we have had more than one group come in, they've totally ignored the other groups. They focus on us every single time. And even after they start leaving, they still don't, they still totally, completely ignored the other, other troops or family units. What, what, you, you said you were with the Kiowa? Yes. Yeah. And, and this was in central Oklahoma? Yes. Yeah, and what what did the Kiowa believe about that? What did they say about it? Uh they strongly believe in Bigfoot, you know, and um, I mean they're they're very attuned to them. Um, at least the, the the Kiowa that I personally know, they also believe there's some kind there's that there is a very strong spiritual element to them, very strong, and I have. I've been in the field extensively with with the Comanche, um, Cherokee, Apache, Kiowa, Delaware, Wichita, Cherokee. Uh, well, also Lakota Sioux. Uh, 
Blackfoot, uh, Crow, Navajo, and they all, they all, to them, it, you know, they're a normal part of nature, but they have a very strong, there's something very spiritual about them, <clears throat> but they're a perfectly normal part of, of, of the world to them. My great grandmother was, you know, who you talk to either full blood or half Cherokee. I think she was more likely half Cherokee. And <clears throat> to him, to, I mean, to her, they were just as normal as, as, you know, squirrels and, and birds and deer, you know, and rabbits. <laughs> they were totally normal. But she, uh, she very strongly believed, though, that there was an evil element out there, an evil creature that um, she she referred to the she referred to the Bigfoot as Nunyunui, but she would also talk about, and this is weird when she would talk about them, it would be in the middle of an open area where nothing nobody could get near her that she didn't want near her. You know, nobody could be hiding out there listening. And she would pull you up close to her and she would sort of hunker around and, and hunker down and look around and she would whisper it. But what she said was she'd call it the, the Kekla Kudla. If if I can remember it correctly. And and it was evil. And the Kekla Kudla lived way back into the waste places, way beyond where the Nunyunui or the normal Bigfoot live. And she said that the Nunyunui or the regular Bigfoot try to protect us from the Kekla Kudla. Why now, would they do that? It beats me. She died when I was y very young. And um, I mean, uh, so I have... Uh, I, I don't know. I, you know, I was just a child, just a kid, you know, just a child. And, um, you know, if, Lord, I wish I could, you know, I wish, you know, I had an opportunity to, to talk to, uh, you know, to some of these folks, um, you know, like my great grandmother and stuff, you know, knowing the things that I know now, but, um, you know, like my grandfather tried to tell me some stuff about them, and you know, right before he died. So you, so you think that they believe that there were there were good ones and there were bad ones? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yes. She also talked about something, and Barton and I talked about this. I don't know if we want to go off in these weeds or not. She also told me some stuff about the little people. Oh yeah, and little people is something that I don't do, <laughs> but. And I didn't put much stock in it. However, when I saw there was a researcher up in up north uh, in like Minnesota or Wisconsin by the name of Judy Klein, a lady who's a heck of a good researcher, and she got an utterly fantastic photograph of a little person looking at them. They were up there on an expedition in Minnesota in the summertime, and she thought that she felt like something was watching them, and she just turned around with her camera and snapped a couple of shots. And she caught one with his head poked up out of a bunch of vegetation watching them as they went by. Now, the crazy thing about this is that Granny McKnight said that the um, little people decorated themselves with vegetation, with vines and stuff like that you know, so that they could hide, you know, better or camouflage themselves. This picture that Judy got, it's got a vine over its, across its head. And, and maybe even a, and maybe even a big leaf over part of its head too. But it's absolutely positively got a vine wrapped over the top of its head. What did it look like other than that? Yeah, was it humanoid? It had human-like face. Oh, absolutely, yes. It had it had dark eyes. had a had a, a thin, pointy nose. 
It had thin lips. It, I, it, all you could see was just its head poking up out of the vegetation. I mean, I've got the picture. Um, I mean, I, she shared a shared picture with me. And, um, um, well, you're allowed and it, it's, it's actually, people. uh, I can, I, yeah, but, uh, well, I, we would all love to see I, it. I, I, have, I have, I have, well, I've, sh- I've shown it publicly. Yeah. I've shown it publicly, but I make sure that I give her credit, you know, make sure that, that it's acknowledged where it came from. Judy's a good researcher. Right. And, um, so do you have um, Facebook or anything like any kind of social media, Tim? Yes, I do. Uh huh. All right. So if you yeah. don't mind, would you post that on the Paranormal Roundtable group page? Yeah, I, I can do all that. The would love to see that. Yeah, are you yeah. are you in the Paranormal yeah. Roundtable group? Uh? I don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't get on Facebook very much, and uh, you know, uh, um. I don't know if I'm a member of it or not. I'd have to look. Let me, well, let me just see. I've got my computer on right now, right in front of me. Let me just look. Uh, let me go to Facebook. You definitely need to be if you're not. Oh, well, let me tell you. Let me tell you. Uh, Martin, should I tell Should I say tell them what I told you about what she told me about the little people? Sure. Yeah, we want, okay. we, we want to disclose all the information that we have. Yeah, well... When she was little, they traveled from um, they traveled from eastern North, western North Carolina to East Texas, where they lived for a while, down in uh, San Angelina County, I think, one of the East Texas counties. And they later on ended up moving to Arkansas from there. But anyway, while they were traveling from East Texas, I mean from Western North Carolina to East Texas, the little people followed them. But there were two groups of them. There were the good little people, and then there were, there were the evil or the bad little people. And the good little people kept trying to run off the bad ones, chase them away, but they would always catch back up with them a few days later. And then it would start all over again. But some of the little people were good and, and tried to sort of look after them and help them and watch them. But they were the bad, you know, but there were bad little people. Now I was too young to ask any questions or no, but all after all the things I've heard about the bad little people since then as an adult makes me wonder if they were some of the cannibalistic ones or, you know, what was bad about them? What made them bad? I don't know. I was never told that, but she very distinctly said that there were two groups, a group of good ones and a group of bad ones that followed them all the way from western North Carolina to east Texas. Wow. And that they had well, speaking of and pictures, that they had, speaking of pictures, Tim, before we get off here, I want to ask you about this yeah. one picture. There was a uh a picture of a dog man that went went around a few years back that seemed like everybody in the field got but me. And could you tell tell all the uh, listeners about that? What happened to that picture? Yeah. <laughs> okay, Dallas Gilbert was researching in an area in southeastern Ohio, off the Ohio River. Uh, it was a creek that actually up a creek valley that actually ran into the Ohio River. If I remember this correct, the location correctly. All right. Back then, Jim Hart, my buddy Jim Hart, otherwise known as Bubba Gump in the Bigfoot world, he was doing a lot of a lot of work for the government then, and Jim was sort of on the cutting edge of um, of photo analysis and stuff, and and uh, uh, doing a lot of the the uh, lab work to try to bring out different things in it. And Dallas Gilbert was sending film negatives to Jim periodically and asking him to look and see what he could find in, you know, certain frames. And Jim was doing it for him. And it was pretty interesting, some of the stuff he found. And um, most of the time he found nothing. Um, they were going up, they were going up in this, through this creek bottom, you know, going upstream. And this was in a, you know, fairly deep, 
gorge or or hollow or valley or whatever you want to call it, but it was also fairly wide on the bottom. I mean, it was like you know probably 150 to 150 or so yards across, 100 yards across from side to side. Um, and the creek meandered down through the bottom of this, you know, down through there. They got to a point where Dallas said that they just had an overwhelming sense of dread, and he got to the point he couldn't pick up one foot and put it in front of the other. I know exactly what he was talking about. I've had that happen to me many times. You just, you know that you're getting in danger, and if you take one more step, you're dead. And he got to that point point and i've done the same thing he took his camera out and this this back in the film camera days and he took five shots he panned and took five overlapping shots where he felt the danger was coming from would have been where he where he took frame number four it would have been to his about two o'clock to his front right and he, so he sent this he sent this piece of f- film to to Jim with these five frames on it, and he said he said look he said concentrate on frame number four you know the fourth frame in the series he said I believe that there's you know that there was there that was watching us that that and we were in grave danger and so Jim picked all through it and everything. And he found one oddball thing, which Jim and I decided it was pareidolia, and it looked like a it looked like a velociraptor walking back into the deeper into the woods, looking back over its shoulder, is what it looked like. But we decided it was pareidolia. So he started looking at some of the other frames, and I had gone home, and uh, this it was about eleven o'clock at night. Now, this is pre-cell phone days. When I pulled up to the house um, it started to go in, the phone was ringing. I answered the phone. It was Jim. He said, you got to get back over here. I said, man, it's 1130, you know. He said, no, get back over here. You will not believe what I found in, in one, of these, one of these frames. He said, get back over here now. Okay. I got back in the truck and took off back to his house. Go back into his shop. And he's got this thing pulled up on the screen. When I walked in there and I looked at that, my heart nearly stopped. I literally, you've, you've heard people talk about your blood running cold. My blood ran cold. It stopped me in my tracks. It took my breath away. He had the head and shoulders of a dog man standing there. Next to a tree, un- under underneath a, a tree limb, staring right into the camera. The picture was so clear, you could see the pupils of his eyes. You could see its nostrils. You could see the wrinkles in its nose. It had its lips curled up. It was snarling, and a, probably a quiet snarl. My my dogs do this at each other a lot. They'll they'll raise their lips up. And they won't make a sound, but it's a sign to the other dogs. You better leave my treats alone, or you better leave my toy alone. You know, this thing was had its lips curled up in a snarl. You could see its upper and lower canines perfectly. Its ears were laid back in a threatening manner. Not, uh, I mean, this thing, and it had it. It it absolutely is the most evil I've ever seen. It, I've told people many times, in fact, Jim used to, if you can look at that picture and your blood doesn't run cold, and if it, do, if it doesn't affect you, you don't have a soul left in you. Unbelievable what this picture looked like. That's scary, huh? That's scary. And I showed it to a bunch of people. I even showed it to a few people that I trusted at work. They're like, you know... <laughs> They're like, holy crap. I, I mean, I had people actually get away because it was so evil. They didn't want to. They'd glance at it, and it'd, just, it'd blow them away, and they'd get the heck away from it. And so at that time, this was in the in the peak of the old uh, ABRF, Alabama Bigfoot Research. Um, 
uh, I can't remember what the F stand for, stood for, but um, Mike McLean's group. And um, Mike was an ex-government guy, very heavily involved in a lot of computer um, cryptogra- cryptography, a lot of computer security, a lot of stuff. Mike wrote his own code for the ABI- ABRF website. Um, the reason being, he wanted to be able to control it, and he and was to try to keep government probes out. And he also would monitor our personal computers and let us know when they were, um, you know, if we gave him permission to. And he would let us know when somebody was probing our computers. And um, so what we did is, you know, of course, Jim gave the, the picture back to Dallas you know, showed him what he'd found. And um, it scared the bejeebers out of Dallas. Scared the bejeebers out of everybody that looked, looked at it. So what we what we tried to do, because this was the best picture of a, of a dog man that anybody had ever heard of, is we disseminated that picture pretty, with Dallas's permission to quite a few people. We had it posted in numerous places on the ABRF website. I mean, it wasn't hidden from the public. I mean, we got it out there to quite a few people. I had it saved in multiple places on my computers. And it was in multiple places on the ABRF website. It later on, when when we became the Bigfoot Outlaws, it was still around. We had it on multiple places on the uh, the Bigfoot Outlaws uh, sites. All of a sudden, you know, just after Mike had died, Mike McLean had died, um, one day somebody went to look, went to pull that picture, one of those pictures up, and couldn't find it. And so he started asking around. So I had people ask me, well, hey, you still got a copy of that, uh, of Dallas's, Dogman picture? Yeah, I got I got several of them. I started looking. Couldn't find it. It's disappeared off. The we asked and asked and asked in various groups and stuff. Does anybody have a copy, still have a copy of Dallas's Dogman picture? Never have found one. And and it was out there for it was out there for probably 10, close to 10 years, and it just disappeared. Don't know what happened to it. Don't know how it disappeared. And, uh, I talked about that at the conference, uh, Tim. Uh, me and several other researchers, it's been several years now, but we had a picture. And it's funny, I think you mentioned the state of Minnesota just, just a little bit earlier, but I, I had one out of Minnesota. And it disappeared. I mean, it's it's a we- really weird thing. It's a very, I've been over this with Barton and several other researchers, and it's just um, I think that they can take things, you know, whenever they want. I mean, um, they yeah, being, yeah, I agree. you know, forces that be. I mean, power that be, whatever they can they can get rid of. Yeah. And, you, and you worked at you worked for NASA, you know. So I worked for, I worked for NASA and the Army Missile Command. Mm-hmm. And, so you 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 were yeah. private information. Did, you know, is is that how you right. began the like to to kind of figure out like you know, there's certain things that I you can't do or talk about. Had, like, well, I held a top secret clearance for 31 years. Mm-hmm. And, and, did you ever see any of these things a, in I captivity? Also held a nuclear, I also held a nuclear Q clearance. Did you ever did you ever witness any of these things in captivity? You were talking about Edwards Air Force Base earlier, and I know no, the Air, Edwards Air Force Base is yeah. Never in captivity, but I'll tell you where I I was at Windover, Nevada one time uh, for a purpose, and I saw the the old you've heard about Hangar B or whatever. Mm-hmm. People talk about that. Maybe I've actually seen it. I've seen it. It's uh, it has three 
you can't find it on Google Earth. It's sponged out. But uh, it's got three perimeter fences around it, and the inner one is is electrified. And there are there are um, guard towers on the four corners of the fence. This is an old World War II looking aircraft hangar. I mean, it's paint was peeling and everything when I saw it. it didn't look like. I mean, just if if it didn't have all this security around it, you'd driven right past it. There was an old white white aircraft hangar, and with three security fences around it, and there's signs on the damn fence said, "You know, keep out. Use of deadly force is authorized." You know, it, that's a standard government sign that you see. And there are guard ta- manned guard towers on on the thing. Plus, when we were there, they had eight guys walking. Uh, Walking post on the in between the two outer fences, two on each side. And I asked a guy that worked there, a security guy, I said, What in the hell's in there? And he said, I don't know. He said, But every once in a while, he said, You know, he said, It may go for seven or eight months and nobody shows, you know, nobody's coming or going. He said, Then we may have a car show up and, and they'll pull up and you know, they let them through the gate, you know, shut everything down, let them through the gate, and they drive up there, and they'll get out and open up that door right there, that walk-through door there on, on, I think that was on the east side, and they'll go in and be in there a couple of hours or, you know, 30 minutes or whatever and come back out and, and leave, or sometimes they'll go in and they'll open up one of the hangar doors a little bit, and they'll drive in and be in there a while and come out, close the door back, you know, they'll drive in, close the door. Be in there a while to open the door up. They come out, close the door back, and they leave. And he said, sometimes there'll be a, a truck comes and goes out of the place. But the other people that worked there had no damn idea what was in there. So you, so you but, have no idea what, what it was? Nope. No, not none whatsoever. Or at least if I asked around a lot, but if I ever asked anybody that knew, they didn't tell me, nor did they give me indication, any indication that they knew. You would, I can tell you from personal experience that you would be surprised what <laughs> the things that are right here under our noses. Okay, folks, so that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, tune in to the next episode where I return with my guests and with Barton Nunley. And thank you for listening to PRT. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Good night.